So Archana Basu, who's sitting towards the back, and I are really happy to be here today, um, and happy to be developing this collaboration with the rest of the Healy Center ALS staff. Um, and um, thanks to the MDA for inviting us to be here today. So oops. Um, working in hospitals and other medical settings, um, it's all too easy to see people in limited ways. But we all, of course, lead much richer lives than our medical charts even hint at, right? We hold a range of roles um, beyond the role of patient. Um, you know, we may be architects or teachers, um, gardeners, dog owners, um, marathon qualifiers, Girl Scout leaders, all kinds of things. Um, and when we visit our doctors, we might talk about some of these roles, um, usually as they relate to symptoms. You know, I was training for the marathon and I noticed that on my long runs I was um, fatiguing much more quickly. Or I notice I'm dropping a lot of stitches when I knit, I've gotten more clumsy. Um, but beyond documenting in the medical chart um, how many pregnancies we've had and maybe how many children we live with at home, most of the time our role as parents doesn't get discussed a whole lot. And ALS, of course, can affect how a person parents, um, as well as how they feel about their role as mother or father. Many adults describe being a parent as one of the most important parts of who they are, in fact, really central to their identities. And when an illness affects parenting, there are ripple effects for that person with the disease, as well as the rest of the family, including children and even grandchildren. So this awareness, along with a growing emphasis across healthcare settings um, on family-centered care, led to conversations over several years between doctors on the MGH ALS team, including Drs. Barry and Sakovich, and several of their patients, and clinicians from another program at Mass General um, in the Cancer Center, the Marjorie E. Korf Parenting at a Challenging Time program. So the new Healy Center, ALS PACT program grew out of that mutual recognition um, between patients and family members and the medical team of the value and the real importance of conversations about the ongoing challenges of parenting with ALS. So our new program, as I said, is inspired by the MGH Cancer Center Marjorie Korf PACT program. Um, and this was founded in 1998 by Paula Rausch, who's shown here. Um, it's really grown over the last 21 years now. Um, I'm the associate director of the program, and we have two other fabulous clinicians, Sarah Shea and Mary Susan Convery, um, who are also on the team. And we focus on providing parent guidance to adults in the cancer center and or their co-parent um, as needed throughout their cancer care. Um, and we, we provide this at no cost to, to patients, thanks to um, cancer center support and also philanthropic support. We're able to meet with patients um, both on the inpatient side, so people need to be hospitalized. Um, in outpatient settings, we often go up to the infusion unit and talk with people there. Um, and we do a lot by telephone. Um, and the four clinicians on the team really share the coverage. We're not providing therapy, per se. We're not meeting with people in a weekly way. Um, we're not trying to treat mental health conditions. We're really focusing on collaborating with parents to think through how to um, help their children cope with the parent's illness. And um, we've seen nearly 3,000 parents of more than 6,500 children in looking just at the last 12 years or so. So given all the possible services and supports that might be provided in the ALS clinic, um, and also the reality of limited resources, why did we decide to focus on parenting? Well, I think the first answer is intuitive and goes back to that earlier slide that you know, really for the majority of adults with children, um, being a parent is a pretty um, central role, central to our identities. Um, ALS affects that parenting role, and so to fully support individuals with ALS, it's really critical that we consider this aspect of who they are um, and, and what matters to them. Another answer is that we think that this is a concern shared by a significant proportion of the people that we care for in our ALS clinic. Um, the truth is, we don't really have a very precise estimate at all of how many people with ALS are parenting dependent children, so kids under 18. Um, but a rough estimate based on sort of median age at diagnosis and census data suggests that up to a third of people with ALS may be parenting dependent kids. 
And that number's higher if we count those with um, children who are between like ages 21 and 26, you know, adulting in different ways, um, who are often still quite connected and sometimes even dependent on parents. Um, and then also increasing numbers of adults are um, playing really central roles in, you know, providing parenting support to grandchildren as well. So we're working on developing ways to track how many patients in the Healy Center are parents um, and their children's ages so that we can better target um, services to our patients. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people here are parents? Like say maybe having a child 10 years old or younger. How many have a 10 year old or younger? Yeah, okay. How about between 10 and 20 years old? Uh-huh, and between like 21 and 30 years old? Yeah, okay. Thanks, so I'd say all of you added together, probably over a third, yeah. Um, so um, beyond the sort of intuitive appeal of supporting parents, um, there is really a clear rationale for developing additional resources um, around parenting based on our um, cancer center clinical experience, but also on research about the impact of chronic medical illness on um, family functioning and on child functioning. So in a survey of our cancer center parents, um, we found that many parents reported being less able to meet their children's needs, um, both practical and emotional needs, after a diagnosis than compared to before the diagnosis. And actually the numbers there were really stunning to me. About 98% of parents who participated in the survey said that um, before diagnosis they were able to meet kids' needs either well or very well, so, you know, solidly. Then they said, the same group said after diagnosis, only uh, less than half of them felt like they were able to meet their children's practical and emotional needs well or very well. So they're, it's clearly impacting their own sense of being parents, and that feels really important to attend to. And our research also suggested that concerns about the impact of the illness on children um, were maybe a significant source of um, distress for parents, so it, it mattered to them. And we found that being concerned about the practical and emotional impact of illness on children and, and also about adequacy of support from the co-parent um, were linked with anxiety and depression in the, in the patient. Um, and having a child with um, pre-existing mental health problems um, meant that that parent was more likely to experience concern about the child. Clinical experience and research also suggests that parents really want help talking with children about a serious illness. And critically, that better communication um, generally helps children cope with the illness, um, and on the whole, decreases anxiety in kids. Um, but parents also report having a really hard time finding this support. So we're now building on what we know, and also working hard to learn more about ALS specifically. Um, and the combination of patient advocacy and feedback from the medical team, people like James, um, and our recent experience in the ALS clinic have all suggested a clear need for parenting support. Um, but so far that need has largely gone unmet in really any systematic way. Um, there's very limited information available about helping children cope with um, a parent's ALS. There are several guides published online and they're high quality and um, they cer can certainly be helpful. But in terms of finding anyone to talk to about this, um, I think child mental health clinicians often will lack the knowledge or experience with ALS specifically or even with serious medical illness. Um, and it's understandable, ALS isn't so common, so not all therapists will have run into that. Um, and then the ALS medical team is not trained in child development and mental health. I mean, of course, they're doing all kinds of other things. Um, they've specialized in another area. And in addition, when um, they're seeing people in clinic visits, they have so many other details to attend to. So there's you know, not really time um, to focus on this. Um, and we thought our cancer center um, uh, experience had given us a good foundation from which to sort of think about supporting parents in this way. But our ability to actually do that um, was pretty limited because clinical time was such a scarce resource. So we felt really fortunate when in 2018 the directors of a um, family-led uh, EGL charitable foundation generously agreed to fund a pilot ALS PACT program. And that allowed us to devote clinical time to build a team with experience to address the needs of parents with ALS, um, and eventually to help others to do so as well, we hope. 
Uh, the team includes Paula Rausch, who you saw before, Archna Basu, who's sitting at the back there, and me. All three of us have been trained to work with children and families, um, and we have knowledge of child development, and mental health issues. Um, Paula and I bring our combined 36 years of experience in um, providing parent guidance to adults facing all stages of cancer, um, and also an interest in supporting the bereaved. Um, and Archna brings expertise in the treatment of childhood trauma and grief, um, and also leads research studies on how risk uh, and protective factors impact children's mental health. So since January, we've been providing parent guidance consultations to parents of um, dependent and young adults, so in their 20s, um, kids, who are being treated in the Healy Center. Um, we offer to meet with parents in person after their other clinic visits um, in the, with the multidisciplinary team. Um, we've also spoken with parents on the phone or using telehealth visits, um, much as Dr. Barry was describing earlier. Um, so far, we've spoken with 48 different families um, in the first four months and also provided a number of follow-up visits, um, either in the clinic or by telephone, um, to a number of them as well. And we've also just been getting to know the medical team and they us. Um, and we're feeling really lucky uh, to have great new colleagues. So I said earlier that the ALS PAC program was inspired by and kind of built on the Cancer Center PAC program. And we were wondering how much overlap there would um, really be between the kinds of concerns that um, parents would raise given the opportunity to talk about parenting challenges um, with an illness. We had done some data collection after our cancer center consultations um, to document the kinds of topics that got raised and that got addressed. And we found that concerns really fell into sort of four primary buckets. Um, so those included communication, so things like you know, whether to tell a child about a diagnosis, what words to use, um, how to talk to schools maybe about what was happening at home, providing updates. Um, and then another bucket was child coping and behavior, so things like how to respond to um, children's worrisome emotions. What if they were sad or anxious or upset? Um, what if their behavior changed? What if they got picky or um, stopped, you know, to all the progress on toilet training got reversed? Um, what about, uh, is therapy necessary? And sometimes just trying to figure out whether a child would benefit or, you know, if it was worth the cost to that. Um, another bucket included um, sort of logistical parenting issues. So things like um, if a parent needed to be hospitalized, how would you manage separations from the child? Um, how could you manage community support? You know, people talk about a flood of lasagnas coming in and, you know, how to, how to sort of manage that and have it be useful and not just overwhelming. Um, and custody planning has come up too. And then a final bucket included end of life concerns. So for some families um, thinking about legacy leaving, so would they wanna do any writing for a child? Um, would, was there a way that they could think about passing on their values to children? Um, telling a child that a parent could die soon is another big worry. Um, and then also facilitating visits for a child near a parent's end of life and spending time together. So we looked at the research done so far on parenting with ALS, but found it was nearly non-existent. Um, there's, <laughs> it's a very, very short list. So we're really learning from conversations we've had with families over the last few months. And not surprisingly, there's lots of overlap um, with what we hear in the Cancer Center, but some real differences as well. And that's been interesting and important for us to know about. So for example, we're talking with parents about communication. Um, and parents are trying to figure out what words to use um, to describe what's going on medically, um, whether to call it ALS or something else, um, sometimes even whether to say anything at all, especially if symptoms can kind of be covered up for a while. Um, we've learned that timing issues are a little bit different um, than for parents with cancer, because it can take a lot longer to diagnose ALS. Um, and after diagnosis, there isn't necessarily a treatment recommended that will make things very obvious, like you know, hair, chemotherapy and hair loss. Um, and so we've been also thinking together about ways to preserve connections between a parent and a child when a parent has difficulty with actually speaking. That's a totally different kind of communication challenge that comes up. Um, we're also hearing about parent concerns about child and adult coping as well. Um, so we're listening for parental depression and anxiety because we know that mental health challenges can exacerbate physical challenges. Um, and also can interfere with both parent and family functioning. Um, studies of other chronic illnesses suggest that family functioning also affects children's well-being, um, and that um, 
there's some research that also shows that um, the family caregivers of people with ALS um, are at risk for some emotional distress, including anxiety and depression, and also um, physical strain. So all of that um, affects parenting, of course. We're hearing that it can be hard um, for parents to manage or actually sometimes even identify what their children's emotional reactions are. You know, there are kids who are sort of talkers and you know, come home and tell you everything about their day and then kids who are not. Um, and those kids can be hard to read and parents feel like they think maybe they're fine but maybe aren't so sure. Um, we know that emotions in a family are interrelated. So children have a harder time adjusting to a challenging circumstance um, if parents have symptoms of depression or anxiety. On the other hand, or on the other side, the saying that you're only, as you're only as happy as your unhappiest child also seems to hold true. Um, so we're really trying to combine um, our professional understanding of children's emotional lives with parents' kind of expertise on their own kids and their knowledge of their temperaments and their styles of having adapted to other challenges in the past, and really try to then come up with ways that children can feel supported and understood so that they can thrive. Um, we're also learning about sort of the practical effects of ALS, like logistical challenges, um, like juggling transportation for everyone in the family with fewer drivers, um, and also the lack of privacy that can go along with um, having, you know, multiple caregivers in the home, sometimes, you know, uh, non-familial caregivers. Um, and we've had conversations about who does what at home, and who takes care of whom, and how that's different from before, and how that feels. Um, some conversations about the difficulty of getting kids and often teenagers to kind of help in the ways that you wish that they might help and kind of step up to the plate. And we talk with parents about finding a balance between um, every person's need to sort of have independence and to be connected to the larger world, to be engaged in activities out there, and also the need for the family to really feel like a cohesive team in some ways, to be able to work together. And this balance will vary depending on the age of the children in the family. Um, younger children are often happier to be at home, um, so making home feel as normal as possible for them is gonna be really important. Uh, teenagers may wanna be out with friends a lot more, be more involved in activities um, outside, and they need that time. Um, but there may also be sometimes a real need for them to be at home too, and that's not always easy for parents to negotiate. Um, and finally, we're learning about the concerns that parents have about having a life-threatening illness. Um, the impact of an uncertain future on all kinds of decisions that, that um, can affect children. You know, like whether to move to a more accessible home and how that'll affect, you know, taking kids out of a certain school system, for instance. Um, also, the sense of urgency that sometimes parents feel in wanting to make sure their children are really well prepared to be out in the world. Um, and feeling it's so important to make every minute together count. And sometimes everyone in the family feels that way and is sort of on board with that, but sometimes not. And again, I think teenagers are a good example of people who may be not always. Um, and some parents too struggle a lot with sort of the rough edges that um, they notice in their children, partly because they're just hard to deal with or a little bit irritating, but I think also because it's hard to think that you might not be able to see those smooth out over time. Um, and we've heard that some, that. Um, actually both parents can feel anxious about the potential for one of them to be a single parent in the future and are having to sort of sort through that. So being a parent with ALS or a co-parent with someone um, certainly gives rise, rise to a unique set of challenges and concerns, but how about for children? Um, there's really um, not a lot of research literature on the impact of ALS on kids. There is some more literature though on the impact of chronic medical illness on children and, and other kinds of illnesses. So there's a little bit more information about um, illnesses like Parkinson's or MS, and then there's even more about um, illnesses like cancer and HIV AIDS. So one thing we've learned from that literature is that it is really important to monitor children for symptoms of depression and anxiety and, and have a plan for, for um, helping if those become um, noticeable. We also know that it's really common for children to take on new roles. Um, they might to help they might help um, occupy a parent. For um, I was hearing about an eight-year-old who really likes to read to her dad. Um, they may help a parent kind of pick up items or deal with electronics or do some cooking at home. And some kinds of helping really do um, allow children to learn new skills, um, to build maturity, 
and to sort of feel proud of their ability to contribute to the family and, um, and also kind of closer to the parent. Um, but other times expectations can be a little bit too high um, or new responsibilities might make a child feel kind of isolated from their friends um, or put pressure on children in terms of um, their being not so able to continue in other activities outside the home that are pretty important for their development. It's not always obvious what's age appropriate and reasonable for a particular child, and especially given their personality and temperament, and what's not. So that may be a conversation that we would try to have with parents too. Um, and just like for adults, children have to find a way to cope with a really wide range of feelings and thoughts about the illness. Um, and emotions can include, you know, again, for, like for adults, worry, sadness, anger, a sense of injustice, like it's just not fair. Why did this happen to my parent? Um, concern for the co-parent, um, embarrassment, and also on the other side, a sense of pride in being able to help out, um, empathy for a parent's suffering, or with younger children sometimes even some excitement about um, extra treats or extra attention they may be getting from having other people come into the home. Common worries can depend a lot on a child's developmental stage. Um, and also on communication between family members, how much is being talked about, and of course what's visible about the illness. Um, but some concerns might include family finances and how, like, how will college maybe get paid for. Um, some children worry about getting sick themselves. Um, younger children may not be aware that ALS is not contagious. It's, it's like a broken leg, you can't catch a broken leg. Um, Older children may be curious about the genetic aspect, and there may be conversations that parents are considering about that. Um, kids can sometimes worry about, you know, how their friends are understanding all of this, what their friends are going to think. Um, and then children certainly worry about losing a parent. Um, they may also have some kind of egocentric concerns that can feel really disconnected from what the parent's experience is. You know, like, uh, can we go shopping for new cleats tonight because I need them tonight? <laughs> um, that just don't align with kind of what the, the parent experience of day-to-day -day life is like. And, you know, that's, that's pretty normal. Um, kids don't develop the frontal lobe capacity to plan in advance um, just because life is, is more challenging. Um, and also just the point, some worries will get expressed and others not, um, depending on the child and family communication style. So it can be helpful to think about what might be on their minds um, and then how to help address those concerns. So our mission is really to collaborate with parents to help children thrive in spite of the challenges of having a parent with ALS. We're really trying to build on family strengths, identify those strengths and build on them. Um, things like, you know, what was learned from other challenges in the past, or um, strengths like um, humor, or the family's ability to really um, pull together and work as a team, um, or connections with a larger community of support. And we also try to work with parents to really um, choose ways to talk about ALS that will help children develop a clear narrative over time of what's happening in manageable chunks, you know, a bit at a time, that can help reduce uncertainty um, and reduce misperceptions, um, and also enhance their sense of control over the situation. I mean, I think all of us have the experience of knowing more and being brought into conversations. Even when things remain uncertain, we want to know what we can know, and kids are not different that way. So what does that actually look like? Um, over the years with our Cancer Center PAC program, we've distilled some sort of general principles about supporting children that we often talk about with parents. And we've modified them. They've had to be modified a bit for the ALS um, packed work. But I thought I'd share a few so you sort of get a feel for um, what our overall approach or mindset is like. Um, you'll see some of these ideas in our brochure, which I um, left in a pile out on the front um, desk out there. Um, it should be, I'll note, it should be trifolded um, to actually look like the brochure as it's meant to be. And I got them hot off the press um, the other day and didn't leave myself enough time to fold them all, so you can, I'll do that if you'd like. But please do pick one up. Uh, I think one of the most important things is that there's no one right way to describe ALS. Um, but I think no matter what words are chosen, it's important that they're honest and accurate and age appropriate. Um, it's really easy to use vague language, like I'm weak or I'm dealing with a leg problem. Um, but research looking at other illnesses really does suggest that children given specific information about a parent's illness um, actually have lower rates of anxiety 
rather than being chronically more anxious as parents kind of fear. It's important to check in later about what children actually take away from conversations you have with them. You know, how much they understand, how much they remember versus forget, um, or even misinterpret. Um, and for example, talking about, say, having a motor neuron disease without describing what motor neurons do might not stick for a lot of children. And so there's a reason to sort of go back and, and understand what they, what they took in. Um, parents may need to start these conversations. And I think um, we hear a lot, you know, let your children lead the way, like take, follow their lead. Um, if they're not asking questions, you don't feel like you need to bring it up. I think that's not always true. Um, there are lots of reasons that kids won't ask about changes other than they're sort of oblivious or unaffected or don't care. Um, it's, it's far from ideal for kids to um, hear about hard news by overhearing other conversations. It sort of sends a message that the child um, shouldn't ask questions, I think, um, or even that the child's not trusted with the information. Um, and also if a child's overhearing a one-sided conversation like a phone call, it's really easy to sort of misinterpret what they're hearing and, and pull together a different explanation for what's, what's going on. I think especially in early conversations about the illness, it can be helpful to invite children um, to describe what they've been seeing. What have they noticed? Um, and what do they think or worry is going on? And then you can tie those observations to your explanations and it, it makes it easier for kids to understand. And you'll also have a better sense of any mis misinterpretations that you may need to help correct. Um, it helps to talk about the ways that the illness can directly affect each child in the short term so you can help them prepare. And then keep talking over time um, and check in with children at sort of time, think about the times that they may be most um, open to talking with you. So for a lot of children, it's in the car. You're driving around and they're in the back seat maybe and they tend to chat more. Some kids, it's bedtime. But you'll sort of, you know, people know their own children and, and when those times are. You can ask if they're hearing too much about the illness or not enough detail or just the right amount. Some kids are happy to give parents a grade. You know, you get a C for communication. Um, let them know you want them to ask questions. Um, and that when you can't answer them, you will go back and talk to your doctor, try to find out more information and get back to them on that. Um, stalling is really a legitimate parenting tactic as long as you come back around and, and you know, be sure to fill in the blanks and follow through. I think the other important thing is to pay attention to emotions and there's literature in, again in the cancer field that suggests that um, parents are better at kind of thinking about the content, talking about the content about the illness rather than addressing emotions in children and I think it's probably just true about parents in general. Um, sometimes when our children are really upset, um, we just want so much to alleviate their distress uh, that we move too quickly to solve the problem. Um, or find a bright side or tell them, you know, not to cry because everything's going to be okay. Um, and problem solving, finding benefits even in challenging situations or, you know, expressing hope absolutely are hallmarks of resilience. But those have to be paired with um, naming and um, normalizing and validating a whole range of feelings for kids and letting children know that you share many of those same feelings. And it might also help if you talk about the ways that you're trying to cope with those same emotions um, to model for them what that looks like when it goes well. So looking forward, we have a lot to keep learning about sort of the unique parenting challenges that are associated with ALS compared to other chronic medical illnesses so that we can better tailor our consultations. Um, we're beginning to explore the kinds of follow-up we might be able to provide to bereaved families and sort of what that could look like, what families might need and want. Um, we also have a plan to collaborate with other providers at MGH um, and also in the house call program um, to increase their comfort with being able to address parenting challenges. Um, and we have, in some cases, reached out to um, mental health providers who are caring for family members um, to be it, within the community at a parent's request to think together about how to best support children. Um, this coming Monday, so day after tomorrow, our CORF, the Cancer Center PAC team, is um, launching an online uh, continuing education course uh, for mental health and medical providers that um, is focused on providing parent guidance around um, a parent's medical illness um, to support children's resilience. And um, it's uh, going to be 
um, it, it will award 10 continuing education credits that are free thanks to a um, grant from the Lynch Foundation. Um, and we're really hopeful it might be useful to providers um, in ALS as well, although it does have a focus on cancer, but most of the principles are pretty general and, and applicable. Um, we're also hoping to do a thorough um, search and review of what the written resources are out there um, and create some new materials that might be helpful to parents um, who are cared for in other settings um, whom we can't meet with directly. Uh, and we've started with a brochure about our program that I mentioned earlier out on that front table. Um, and also the ALS Association, we've noticed, has published some really nice materials um, about supporting children. Um, so that's, that's another resource that I think we're gonna try to, again, just have, sort of have in mind so it's, it's easy to, for parents to sort of see a library of what's out there. Um, and another project we've talked about is trying to um, adapt a website that we developed for the Cancer Center for ALS specifically. So here's a place where I'll ask her a little bit of help, but um, if any of you would be interested in looking at this website, um, the address is um, up there at the top, mghpac.org. Um, as you're reading it, if you think that there are parts that don't hit the mark for you, um, if there are kind of frequently asked questions that you think we should include, um, if there are adaptations you'd like to see that would, that would better target this for your questions and needs, we'd really, really welcome your feedback. And you can email us, um, there's an email address down at the bottom there. It's mghalspact, P-A-C-T, at partners.org. Um, I spelled it out, there's, but there's no spaces actually in the um, real email address. But please, we'd, we'd really appreciate your thoughts about how we can adapt this, because um, we'd like to We'd like to bring it over and, and make it really um, helpful. So just to end, I just wanted to um, say a bunch of thank yous. Um, you know, the families we've met um, who've been so eager to teach us, it's, it's really felt like a privilege. Um, and their stories are really compelling us to learn more. Um, fam some families have shared some written materials that they've put together or other, other resources because they really are hoping to help other people. Um, the ALS team at Mass General for sharing their knowledge and teaching us about um, you know, the disease itself, um, sharing resources with us, and just a really warm welcome and collaboration. Um, Alana, our research intern, because she's been very patient and tenacious in trying to help us figure out how we can figure out how many people are parents and who are parents and who we should be meeting with. Um, the EGL Charitable Foundation and other donors for their generous financial support that allows us to offer consults at no charge to parents. And MDA to, for inviting us today. We appreciate being part of this lineup. Um, and all of you for attending today. So thank you all. I don't know if there are any questions. Sure, I'm happy to. And I, I think you're exactly right, and I, I, it's not just kids, it's adults too, right? We hate it when we don't know and can't predict because it matters so much um, to setting expectations and to planning and to just kind of processing something. Um, and I think I mean, the question of, you know, kind of what kids remember later and what stands out is a really interesting one. I mean, I'm kind of interested in actually hearing from more kids who have been in that position and what's helpful and what's not helpful. What do they wish you would have said? What do they wish you would have said when? Um, I think there's a lot we could learn from kids that way. So thank you very much for that. And I'm glad it was helpful at the time.
Any other questions? So you've you've hit on I think one of the one of the really most challenging parts about this right um, in being a parent and all the feelings about um, you know inadvertently uh, you know absolutely with no control sharing you know part of you with a child that is um, not not anything you would have wished um, so I think it, there, you didn't ask a question there, but I, I think um, that's absolutely something we'll be hearing more about. It's interesting that your daughter is kind of thinking about it um, as she's maybe coming to an age where she may be having her own children and figuring that out for herself too. And um, you know, I had the uh, privilege of meeting for a while with um, Diane Lucente, who's our genetics counselor, and you know, really kind of asking her a lot of questions and within our clinic she, she would probably be the one really to work with parents around making decisions about when um, you know how to how to talk to family members how, when to get tested the process of getting tested and all of that so we're trying to be very respectful about um, you know her her expertise which is different from ours but also to you know to complement each other um, but I, I think that that's a that's a you know, a, a time that makes sense, and and certainly the emotions that come up with it are something that we'll be hearing about and trying to help address too. Um, but yeah, it's that's a tough one. Yeah, no easy answer there. Any any other questions? I want to keep things moving and keep keep things on time so people can be out and enjoy the sun. But again, thank you for letting me talk. <laughs>